Josh Frydenberg, welcome to the program. Nice to be with you, David. So the Prime Minister says there'll be no increase in taxes, no new taxes if you're re-elected. Does that mean you're ruling out any further tax reform for the next three years? Well, the tax reform that we've undertaken is actually cut taxes, like abolishing a full tax bracket at 37 cents in the dollar, seeing 95% of taxpayers pay a marginal rate of no more than 30 cents in the dollar, between $45,000 and $200,000. Our plan was set out in the budget on Tuesday night. It was a plan for lower taxes. It will see a $420 top-up to the low and middle income tax offset, which will see 10 million Australians benefit. Uh, there was also a cutting of the fuel excise in half. Uh, there was also a $120 tax deduction for small businesses that invest in new technology, that in skilling their workers. And there was also an extension of the patent box, which sees a concessional company tax rate of 17 cents in the dollar for new innovation in areas like agriculture technology and low emissions technology. It's a very stark contrast, David. Our plans, as we've delivered, as we said to the Australian people last election, for lower taxes, Labor's $387 billion of higher taxes, and Jim Chalmers, my opponent, saying that he wants to be flexible around tax, he wants to have an election, a budget after the election. Well, the Australian people deserve to know what flexibility on tax for Labor means not after the election, but before the election. OK, well, let's try and stick to your plans, what you're planning for the next three years. Are you ruling out any further tax reform? Well, we've undertaken significant structural tax reform. I'm just asking about the next three years. And, and when the Prime Minister says no new taxes, no tax increases, does that mean no tax reform? Well, what I'm saying is our tax reforms have been lowering taxes. You must be signing up to the Labor definition of tax reform. No, I'm asking about the future, taxes. not the past. Well, our, our future is about lower taxes. We're always looking for opportunities to cut taxes. In this budget, we've done it, both for small businesses mm -hmm and for households. Um, when you look at our what, track record over the last three What is your definition years, of, of, of tax reform? What's the Liberal definition of tax reform? Are you ruling out any, any changes in the next three years? The, the Liberal definition of tax reform is a simpler tax system, a fairer tax system, and lower taxes. That's what we have delivered on everything from small businesses to households, and we've also helped lead the world with the work around the multinational agenda and creating a minimum global tax uh, through the OECD. But a fairer, fairer taxes mm -hmm. could include increasing some and decreasing others. Well, if you look at our big signature stage three tax reform, uh, what that has done is it's maintained the progressive nature of our tax system and that's always been a focus for us. So multinationals, big tech, they won't face any tax increases if you're back in. Well, again, we've laid it out in the budget. We did invest more money in the budget around multinational tax avoidance. We have made changes... You're collecting for, an extra £2 billion well, for multinationals. Correct. And it's, look, base erosion, profit shifting, the work that we've done through the OECD leading the world on a global minimum tax has meant we get a better tax system. All right, uh, let's talk about the cost of fuel. Mm. Uh, five years ago, when you were the Minister for Energy and the Environment, you wanted Australia to catch up with the rest of the world and introduce fuel efficiency standards. Mm. You said, if Australia had fuel efficiency standards in line with comparable nations, the fuel saving per passenger vehicle could be above $500 a year. It, it never happened. Um, are you saying you won't touch that reform for another three years as well? Well, we're always looking for um, improvements around fuel efficiency standards because when I said that, it's not just about lowering the cost of petrol, but it's also about environmental outcomes. So you might do this? Well, again, th this is work that you know, Angus Taylor, as the minister responsible, had been undertaken. But what well, we've five, done... Five in years the, ago, you, <laughs> you what, were going to do it now. But what not. we've done in the budget is we've halved the fuel excise by more than 22 cents a litre. Yeah, we've I, done it for six months. You've, you've said that. that you've yeah, said that. And it's very important. But, uh, just to be clear, are you saying you could still do fuel efficiency standards after well, the election? We've always been committed to getting fuel efficiency standards in place, but obviously working through some of those details with the stakeholders is important. Right, so it's still alive. That issue, is always, that issue has been a focus for us. Uh, OK, you did instead cut the fuel excise for six months. Will it definitely go back up in September no matter what? That's what the legislation said. The legislation sunsets. That's our plan. Um, what we have done is, as you say, done it for six months. Uh, we cut it by more than 22 cents a litre. In New Zealand, they cut it for just three months, but they did 25 cents a litre. In France, they did it for four months. In Ireland, they did it for five months. In the Netherlands, for six months. Australia hasn't been alone in cutting fuel excise, but if you're a family with two cars and you fill up once a week, you're $30 a week better off, up to, and $700 over the six so months. So if you're a treasurer or even opposition leader in six months' time, you, you, you won't argue we need to keep this fuel excise cut right I'm certainly not arguing that. And the other thing to point 
to David is that Treasury's forecast for the price of a barrel of oil is down to $100 by the September quarter. Now it's around $115, $120. So we actually think the barrel of oil price will come down. Okay. Uh, there was the fuel excise cut. There was the cash payments as well to deal with cost yep. of living. The Assistant Treasurer, Michael Sukar, also announced a $10 cut in the price of medicines. Here he was. The amendment will reduce the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme general patient category by $10 from the current amount of $42.50 to the new amount of $32.50 commencing on the 1st of May 22. A $10 cut in the price of medicines, why wasn't that in your budget speech? Well, what we've done in my budget speech is I announced that with, with respect to the thresholds, we would change that when you need multiple scripts. That's available to 2.4 million people. That's different to what people. Michael Sukar just That said. is a different point, but I didn't... So what, didn't so is that in the budget or not? That well, what Michael was talking about actually was the 2.4 million people that will benefit with the reduction in the in getting multiple scripts. So that's no, he wasn't. He said that the price, the current amount, will go from $42.50 to $32.50 from the 1st of May. Is he right? Well, again, what we've been talking about in the budget was taken for 2.4 million Australians to get a reduction in the amount that they pay for their. Was tax this $10 rate. price cut taken out of the budget? Was it? No. Um, what I'm talking about is there was a 2.4 million people benefiting from reducing... The safety net, the, I know the, that. The safety net. But, that was but he specifically said, I can play it again if you like, there'll be a $10 cut in the price of medicine. Is that happening? Well, again, our focus has been on 2.4 million people getting I know a reduction. your focus is yeah. there, but is that $10 cut well, happening? Well, again, what Michael has done when he was introducing the legislation was talking about the thresholds that have been reduced. And this will is be... Is he right about the $10 well, cut? Well, again, our, our focus has been on 2.4 million I know people. your focus is there. And, just, and, just to be clear one more time, is the price of medicine coming down $10? The price of medicine is coming down for 2.4 million people, either concession card holders or non-concession card holders. Previously, you needed 48 scripts. Now you need um, 36 scripts. Mm. If you are a concession card holder, and that's what happens after that? That's what, a different thing to what he but said. But that's what we that's what we've been talking about, so, and then they become so free. a $10 cut's not happening. Well, again, what we've done is both for concessional card holders and for non-concessional card holders, you get a substantial reduction in the cost of your medicines as a result. The, you, you did um, also pump a lot of money into the regions. We did. Various pots of money for regional billion infrastructure. Dollars. You've called this unprecedented. Mm -hmm. Just happens to follow the deal that was difficult with Barnaby Joyce and the Nationals over net zero by 2050. Some of the projects you're funding, including the Hellsgate Dam in North Queensland, mm -hmm. don't have a business, a, a, case, a business yeah. case. Why are you committing $5.4 billion of taxpayers' money to something that you don't know whether it will stack up? Well, again, uh, we've made a number of announcements, $21 billion worth of support for our regions right across water infrastructure, transport infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure and health in order to get more GPs and MRIs. Uh, Hellsgate Dam has been on the drawing board for a number of years. It would obviously be a priority for, for Queensland. We've committed $5.4 billion. We'd like a contribution from the Queensland Government. Wouldn't you but, like a business case, though, to make sure well, that you're not wasting the money? And we are going to be doing business cases. That's absolutely Shouldn't you critical. do that and then commit the money? No, because if you look at, for example, the Melbourne Airport Rail Link, David, we announced $5 billion for that, matched by the Victorian Government with $5 billion before the business case was undertaken. Mm. We will be doing business cases, but what the businesses cases will be telling us is not whether we will be building these dams or these infrastructure projects, it's how we will be doing okay. it. Because the key about business cases is you bring in the surveyors, you bring in the architects, you bring in the engineers, they look at how to do it at maximum uh, value and at minimum cost. The uh, Fair Work Commission will make yep. a decision later this year on aged care workers pay. Uh, the Prime Minister says the government will quote absorb any decision. Um, it's a little unclear what that means. Labor's committed to fund 100% of whatever the, the umpire decides. Whatever that means, yeah. Well, they'll pay 100% of whatever the Fair but, Work Commission decides. But again, decides. You've, got, you've, got, you've got government uh, residential aged care providers and also you've got those in the, in, the, in, the, not for, in, the, in the private sector. And where Anthony Albanese has been all at sea is the costings of his open-ended promises. Well, what about, what about the, the coalition? So, what, how much would you fund of the increase? So, firstly... We've taken aged care funding from $13 billion to $30 billion, a massive increase. We commissioned uh, the Royal Commission and there was 148 recommendations and a five-year plan and I announced $17.7 billion in last year's budget across uh, home care, I guess pay, residential how you'll care. Pay, how you'll so what, we, what we have said is we respect the independent umpire. Hmm. The independent umpire is the Fair Work Commission. 
And then with respect to the private sector, David, what we have now is an independent pricing authority that takes into account the input costs and then it makes the, the subsidies increase accordingly. So we will respect the decision of the Fair Work Commission. But when... But but what, when... What, what does this mean? I mean, it, mm -hmm. whatever they recommend, mm -hmm. will you pay for the lot or will you ask the providers... So obviously when it, comes, when it comes to government, when it comes to government uh, provision in residential care, then we take responsibility for that. When it comes 100%, to the, 100 percent of the payments. we we take responsibility. Obviously, we we pick up the bill today. Okay, but, but the private when, operators, you're saying, so, they'll have to pay for part of so it. So what we say is, there's an independent pricing authority that determines, based on all the input costs, what that increase in subsidy will be. Where that is different to the Labor Party is when Anthony Albanese laid out his so-called five-point plan, he then went on lease sales and said the total cost of that was $2.5 billion, only then to be contradicted the next day by Katie Gallagher, his own shadow finance person, who said, no, that was only for the non-wage yeah, costs. So Labor's so saying he, that's the other so, measure, it's not but, the pay. But he's talking, about, just, real wages, just, but he's talking about real wage increases, right? And so what does that actually mean he will fund? Which part of it for the private sector will he fund? Well, we don't know. We don't know. Well, I've just told you what our plan is. Well, with respect, we don't know what level of this increase, whatever it turns out to be, providers will be required to pick up. And but that's I, I the just independent want to point out authority. that you've got a lot of providers, 60% mm. uh, of aged care facilities on an estimate that's going to be coming out this week, mm. uh, are running at a loss. Mm -hmm. That's even after the increase you announced mm. in last year's budget. 60% yeah. running at a loss, 65% in rural and remote areas. Mm -hmm. If you're asking them to pay more for staff, some of them will shut their doors, aren't they? Well, again, what we did in, as you pointed out, in last year's budget, we paid an extra ten dollars a day per resident. We mm -hmm. we put in place <clears throat> uh, enough, new, new bonus uh, reten retention bonuses for nurses, new other respite services for carers. Obviously, a, a better approach around the workforce, around quality and safety, a new funding model and the like. This was comprehensive uh, transformational reform. But you're going it's to very ask, difficult. Okay, but the point is, sixty percent of them are running at a loss mm -hmm. right now, even after all that. Mm -hmm. You're going to ask them to pay more for their staff. Can they really but afford it? That's why you have an independent pricing authority, because that takes into account all the different other input costs that these particular providers are, encou are encountering, and then it tries to work that out. And okay, ultimately, though, this could cost billions and billions, far more than the two and a half billion that Labor announced for other measures. Well, this week. I mean, where will that money come from? Again, Labor, Labor's so called costings are very fluffy, rubbery. What about you, though? I'm just asking you as Treasurer, well, where yeah. will the money come well, from? Well, we depend, it depends on actually what the Fair Work Commission decides. As you know, there's... I'll decide on an increase of some well, level. Where will the money come from? Well, again, we, you've got to wait to see what actually that decision is hmm. and therefore how much that will cost. There are different estimates, as you know, you know, whether it's Uniting Care or others, they've made different estimates. We're going to wait. Okay. And But what we've made very clear is that we respect the decision of the Fair Work Commission. Uh, in the event of a hung parliament, Zali Stegall mm. says she would be open to supporting a coalition government as long as Scott Morrison is not the leader. Would you be prepared to step up? Well, obviously, we're hoping to win the election and striving to win the election in our own right. With respect to the independents, um, they're firstly, they're fake independents. Um, these independents are... Zali Stegall? Well, they're, they're all having their, their, their strings pulled elsewhere. They're acting as a political party. Who's they're organised... Stegall's... Well, they're acting as a political party. They get their funding uh, from Climate 200. Um, they're former Labor Party members in many cases, including in my own well, seat. Well, let's stick to Zali yeah, but... I don't think she's a former Labor Party member. Um, would, well, would... in many cases they are, and that's the point. And they're running with the implicit support of the Labor Party. They're only targeting coalition members. OK, but back to the and question. And they're running on a Labor Party platform. Would you, would you rather be in opposition than, than take the, the Prime Ministership in, in those circumstances? Well, David, we're seeking to win the election in our own right. Uh, your own seat of Keyong is always a, mm -hmm. a, a challenge to hold. Will you campaign with the Prime Minister in your seat? Well, if he would like to come down, it would be very welcome. And I'll be campaigning with him around the rest of the country, as I'll be campaigning in the rest of the country, off to Western Australia later today. Can you understand, can you believe the, the mess in the New South Wales Liberal Party division wasn't sorted out much sooner? Well, it's less than ideal to say the least and, uh, and obviously I'm glad that it's 
been sorted out now. Um, but uh, don't think that we're the only side of politics has had issues in our own divisions sure. in the Labor Party. But as recently as last Labor week, Party, Labor in the high, but, in the, but in the High Court, mm. there was a challenge in the High Court last week to the Federal Labor Party's d division taking over the Victorian division. So don't think it's okay. just uh, what about a these, pox on one house. Uh, what about these claims uh, that, that uh, Scott Morrison racially vilified a uh, competitor in a pre-selection well, contest, which he denies? He's categorically denied it. And Jamal Riffey, who is one of Australia's leaders of the Australian Muslim uh, Lebanese community, has said about Scott Morrison that he doesn't have a racist bone in his body. That's what he has said. So you never had anyone come to you with concerns about him using language like this or no. his behaviour? Or... No. OK. Finally, um, we're about to head into the campaign. Mm -hmm. This is the end of a pretty extraordinary three years for you as Treasurer, floods, fires, yep. pandemic and so on. Uh, global conflict. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> global recession. Uh, if, if I can invite you not to be uh, uh, you know, overly partisan at this moment, <laughs> just give us a reflection of what have been the mo what's been the most difficult moment and what, any, any regrets about your own decisions? Well, obviously, the most difficult is uh, having been a Victorian and living through in, in Melbourne the longest lockdown of any city in the world, and that impacted every family mm -hmm. in Melbourne. So at a personal level, that, is, that it was obviously very difficult for so many. Um, as the Federal Treasurer, uh, those early days in March and in April were the most difficult because 1.4 million people either lost their jobs or saw their working hours reduced to zero and Treasury feared that unemployment could reach as high as 15 per cent. Now it's the equal lowest in 48 years at 4 per cent. So for me that's been the most rewarding part of the last two years is helping to steer an economy to have one of the fastest and strongest economic recoveries in the world Any and regrets? one of the lowest unemployment rates we've seen. Any regrets over your decisions? Well the only thing I fe well the thing I f regret uh, and I felt really helpless at the time over was the kids being out of school for so long in Melbourne, to be honest. Um, you could be Federal Treasurer, Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party, and you had no say over how we could get the kids back into the classroom earlier. I think that's had a long-term detrimental impact on both education and, and social development outcomes, and I, you know, I feel very sad about that. Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks for joining Thank us.